Hello and welcome to episode 98, I believe, of Postcards from a Dying World. Um, we, listen, I gotta do a little programming note before I, before I jump into this, because um, today was the season finale for Star Trek Prodigy, and um, Issa is going to be coming back to review uh, Prodigy, but um, we're going to have to wait a little bit because in order to do my scheduling to have the best books of the year episode and the secret 100th episode of Postcards from a Dying World, we're not going to do Prodigy for a couple weeks. It is no sign of disrespect to Prodigy, whose season finale made me teary-eyed today, uh, believe it or not. And I'm sure Issa hasn't watched it yet. You haven't watched it yet, right? No, I watched okay. the first half when they aired it, but I haven't watched the newly aired second half. Okay, well, finale is a doozy. I'm excited. Finale, yeah. So, um, anyways, joining me, uh, um, as often um, he does, is Isa Diao, who is going to be breaking down the best movies of the year with me. And for programming reasons, episode 99 will be with Judge Mark Rothenberg doing the best reads of the year. I might do a bonus where I do a thumbnail review of every single book I read this year because I actually had somebody ask me to do that, which is weird. But I figured that, I don't know, that'll be a bonus episode. That won't well, that won't count. Then we're going to do an episode 100, and I'm not telling people ahead of time what the, the topic is because it's going to be a surprise, and it's a very me episode for episode 100. But Issa will be here for that one as well, but he's not going to spoil it. So, we are going to talk today about the best movies of 2022. And um, the reason I invited Isa is because he is one of the biggest movie nerds I know. And so, he's a good person to talk about movies with. However, I do think our lists are going to be slightly different because our movie tastes, while they overlap some, uh, they're not exactly the same. <clears throat> so... Um, what, what I do want to say before getting started, too, is uh, we're going to do uh, top 15 honorable mentions. We're going to do a few categories and we do our top 10. If somebody mentions a movie that is further on the list, Issa is going to tell me, oh, I have that on my list further. Or I'm going to tell him that I have that on my list further. And we will talk about it at its highest ranking. Okay. So I have a feeling that's going to happen a lot today. Okay, so we might have that situation, and so you got to keep an eye on your list as well because you got to you got to you got to tell me if. Um... All right, but let's start with your um, uh, top fifteen through ten um, honorable mentions. Okay, um, I don't really have an order here, so I'm. Uh, should I, do you want me to start with uh, just randomly? I don't. I could. Yeah, I could do it start. however you want. I have them. I I I didn't number uh, ten or fifteen through ten really. Okay. But. So I want to talk about one that was really interesting, uh, and that is three thousand years of longing. Uh, is that on your list? I don't know if that's on that your list. is on my list. Yes. See, I knew this was going to happen. Okay, I will try again. Confess Fletch, the long-awaited sequel to or uh, second movie of the Fletch series. I absolutely I, for I absolutely forgot about that movie, and that oh, might have okay. made my list, but it is not on my list. So, so, so okay. let's discuss Fletch. Yeah, I think if it was if it was just a standalone movie that I know knew nothing about and had no expectations for, I would have been like, oh, that's a pretty cool movie. But I went in thinking there is no freaking way that they're going to make a good Fletch movie after the original Chevy Chase movies. And now, I was wrong. It was great. I really enjoyed it. Well, and and, and to be noted, uh, Fletch is one of my wife's favorite movies of all time. And I'm a huge yeah. Fletch fan. I've seen Fletch many times. Have you ever read any Fletch novels, Issa? I have not read the novels. Okay, so see. I was not aware of what to expect beyond that. Yeah, see, I come to the Fletch franchise as somebody who after seeing the movie many times started reading the books and so i'm a fan of the books and i think the the confess fletch which adapts the fourth um fletch book uh and modernizes it is um you know i think for fans of the books that confess fletch is more like the books than than it is the chevy chase movie so right fair enough. It, and if people don't know the fletch books the fletch books are 
fantastic if you're a fan of dialogue. Um, they are so minimalistly written that there are entire chapters that are almost entirely just the dialogue back and forth. And McDonald, Gregory McDonald, who wrote them, like it's like he doesn't even care about writing prose. It's just like this is the dialogue. It's just all dialogue. It's just all dialogue. So, anyways, go ahead. But any other thoughts on Flash Flash? Because I like yeah, it. Yeah, no, just I really, really enjoyed it. And the expectations were that there was almost no way I would enjoy it. So that was a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, and um, I'm sorry it got dumped to Amazon and wasn't like really promoted. Oh, I saw well. I saw it in the theater. I saw it in the theater. So yeah, it did, it did we saw it at fun. home. Um, I thought John Hamm was great as Fletch, actually, yeah. and I would watch more John Hamm Fletch movies. And I hope they get For to sure. make. Yeah. So okay, the next one. Okay, uh, I have Glass Onion, which I bet is higher on your list. It is not on my list it's at not. all. Oh, so. okay. All right, it was a nice sequel. I enjoyed it. Um, I didn't think it quite had the magic of the first, but it was it was still very good. Um, and it, it honestly could have easily made my list. Like it, it really was. There were a lot that on my list that were just a toss up, and this one just I based it on. I didn't really care to see it again. Like it wasn't uh, a movie I saw twice in the theaters or anything, and it wasn't. Uh, I'm not like, oh, I can't wait to go see Glass Onion again. You know, so that 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 knocked it off my list. But did I did you saw it in the theaters. Movie. I saw it in the theater. Yeah. 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 I would. I think every, every movie on my list I saw in the theaters. Okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't, um, I didn't go to the theater as much this year. Um, I will say, um, I actually liked glass onion better than knives out. Um, which is weird. And I'm a huge Ryan Johnson fan. And I think Ryan Johnson's kind of a, a, um, a, a movie savant and a, an auteur that, and I think he had a lot of things he had to do with Glass Onion in order to make it feel like a sequel, make it feel bigger, like, you know, to do a new story and all that stuff. I think he nailed all those things. It was a very, and I, and I actually think doing a sequel to Knives Out is harder than people probably realize because I think he yeah. makes the, the movie look pretty easy. And that's partially because he had such a great cast. Um, and I liked it but it it just didn't make my list i also uh saw it in the last couple of days so um oh, my okay. list was already i was I, i'm actually very surprised knowing you that that did not make your list i'm really curious even more curious now to hear the rest of your list we should we should mention that we don't know each other's lists yes yeah well in in glass onion um I, i'm just not a big murder mystery guy so um okay. as much as i like ryan johnson um you know, and it it did inspire me that I I actually decided I and listen because Ryan Johnson did all the rounds on all the podcasts, and I've really been enjoying his interviews more than almost the movie. But um, <laughs> it's made me want to see Brick again um, because uh, a couple of people have gotten him to talk about Brick, and um, he's uh, I, I also noticed that he's more gracious about the Last Jedi thing than I ever thought he would be, and. <laughs> um, and, and it's funny too because he i did notice when he was on fresh air they they were kind of giving him an out basically saying like oh all the people who hated the movie were like toxic fans and i thought it was cool that ryan johnson pointed out well there are people that just didn't like what i did with sure. and i thought that that was really cool that he like acknowledged that um even though i'm a i think last jedi rules and i love everything yeah. about it I actually went to the length of getting a last Jedi hat. Um, so <laughs> just, to, just to like trigger people. Yeah. I, I guess I need a way of water hat now, um, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that. Um, yeah. And then, uh, but I glass onion just, it's just not my genre. So that's kind of one of the reasons why it's not high on my list. Um, but I really appreciate um, uh, as a, a fan of good screenwriting. I almost think, the screenplay for glass onion is more impressive than the final movie. If that makes sense, like all the things he had to juggle to, to create the story, um, I thought was, was really impressive. And, um, yeah, and it was yeah. really, really well written. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, yeah, that's, that's all cool. I got to say on glass onion. So, okay. Another one is the unbearable weight of massive talent, the Nicholas cage movie. Um, it was definitely a very unusual movie. <laughs> um, right. I really enjoyed it. It wasn't quite up, wasn't quite, uh, I didn't love it enough for it to make my list, but I, I did enjoy it a lot. 
Um, yeah, I thought it was fun. Uh, like most Hollywood movies seem to be this year. I, I don't know why, but almost every movie that I saw this year, I felt like there was 15 minutes too many. Um, yeah. it, it seems to be like a, a, a dilemma, something that keeps happening where I just keep thinking, all right, you've overstayed your welcome by like just a few minutes. <laughs> and yeah, I definitely felt that on unbearable weight of massive talent. Although, um, yeah, Nick Cage deserves um, a lot of credit for um, taking the piss out of himself. I love that the director said that in one of their discussions that um, he said uh, he was giving him Nick Cage some direction. And he said, Nick Cage said he, he, or he pointed at himself and he said, this Nick Cage might do that. That Nick Cage will definitely not do that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh i thought that was really funny yeah so okay keep going okay um let's see the the next is is just a toss-up i think there were there were four movies that i could have fit in this spot and i'll go through them really really quickly because i know we're you know pressed for time one was bullet train which was just very enjoyable also was a little too long as you as you were alluding to another was violent night which was mostly just that it beat my expectations that it was going to be really terrible and it was actually pretty fun um i was a little upset that the capitalists didn't all die at the end you know but whatever um bros which was uh a pretty standard romantic comedy you didn't see that um, yeah it, it, it was it the parts that were good were great it was also very much too long it it, it had it didn't hit the uh it didn't hit the timing that a romantic comedy is supposed to have. Like, you know, they're to, they meet, they fall in love, they break up and they get back like that. There's a very uh, specific timing that you're supposed to use. And they broke that. And it ended up one section of the movie ended up being too long, but it was very enjoyable. And then the last one is probably the most surprising, like people will make fun of me for this, but ticket to paradise, George Clooney and Julia Roberts. I've not seen um, that. It was <laughs> no, I didn't think you would have, but it was uh, surprisingly entertaining. It's definitely like um, a very simple, silly movie, but, you know, great actors doing a good job and making it very fun to watch. So if you're on a plane or something, that's a great one to catch. All right. So um, I'm going to do uh, my my five honorable mentions, and then I'm going to do a few categories of like most overrated, good, but I, you know, I'll do that stuff. So my top five honorable mentions, one is going to be um, Hustle with um, Adam Sandler, which, uh, did you see that one? That yeah. Basketball movie, right? Yeah, I didn't, see, I didn't see that one. Yeah, he plays a basketball scout, and um, as a hooper myself, uh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a tough, uh, you know, a tough judge of a basketball movie, but it, it was a very good basketball movie. I thought Adam Sandler was really good in the movie. And um, yeah, it was really enjoyable. And um, the main character kind of reminded me of uh, Yusuf Nurkic, who is the center for my Portland Trailblazers. So I kind of like that because <laughs> he's kind of a similar, well, he didn't get discovered in a totally Hollywood fashion, but nonetheless, uh, I liked that movie. Um, and my next honorable mention is Bones and All, starring uh, Timothy Chalamet from the director of Call Me By Your Name and the uh, Suspiria remake. And I don't know how to pronounce his very Italian name. So Bones and All is a weird movie. It's based on a YA novel that is uh, um, about these monster cannibal teenage kids who kind of go through a coming of age road trip around the Midwest. Did and this just come out like in the past like week or two or something? It came out very or... in the last like month or so. Um, okay. I, I haven't seen this one yet either. Yeah. And here's the thing. Here's a couple things that won me. The reason why I, I, I like beeline to watching it is because the screenwriter was on a podcast that I listened to and he said that the author of the book said, you can make all the changes you want, but just don't lose the vegan subtext. And uh, I thought, okay, now I'm interested. Um, one of the cool things is that um, the director <clears throat> who is Italian and he has a lot of experience with LA and he said, yeah, I, he had a lot of experience with LA and New York, but he was making this movie that was about a road trip around the Midwest. 
And so he took his crew, his production crew, and they got in a van and they made the road trip over three weeks <laughs> before they started <laughs> production, and, and which is really kind of cool. And I think it shows up in the movie a little bit. And um, the movie is really creepy and weird and the thing is it it's based on a ya novel and i and because it's so creepy and gross and weird it's almost impossible to imagine it being a ya novel so i'm kind of now curious about the book um and uh mark rylance i think is his name the character actor <laughs> excuse me he was in don't look up and everything he plays like this creepy david lynchian villain in it and he is worth watching the whole movie for, even though he's only in it for probably 20 minutes. But the dude is way creepy and it's one of the best creepy performances I've seen in a long time. Like I would give the guy a supporting actor nomination for, for this movie. It'll never happen. <laughs> right, just, yeah. uh, next <clears throat> on my honorable mentions is Weird, the Weird Al uh, biopic. Uh, is okay, that I have a lot to say about this movie. Yeah, it's not it on, on my list, list, but I've it's not on my list, but I have a lot to say about it. <laughs> okay. Um, and weird is there because I didn't watch the Funny or Die trailer, I had never seen it. I think I wouldn't have liked the movie as much if I had seen the trailer. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the trailer until after I didn't I didn't watch the trailer either. I yeah. went and told him like well, and, and I know the trailer, like they play it as a part of the live show at Weird Al shows, so it's like it's it's been a thing. Um uh, but I had never seen it. So, um, and I thought the movie was hilarious. Um, I didn't think you could do another biopic spoof after Walk Hard um, <laughs> because I thought they hit everything. Um, right. the, the scene where he's at the dinner table and the mom says, uh, we think you should stop being yourself and stop doing anything that you <laughs> love was, was hilarious. The factory where they don't know how they make things. Um, right. It was very weird, Al, that it spoofed the biopics, and it was really great. Yeah. It was a wee bit long, um, but it it and kind of overstayed the joke a little bit. Um, and um, uh, Evan Rachel Wood as Madonna was hilarious. See um, that that was where I disagreed. Like I thought, so if you had stopped me when they introduced Madonna, if you'd stopped the movie and said you know okay that's all you get to watch what was your number one movie of the year that would have been my number one movie of the year that would have been the top of my list i love weird al everyone knows i love weird al that was made for me personally like i feel like it was like aimed at me i laughed the entire time like i was dying for the first half and then when madonna got introduced it kind of went off the rails and I didn't really like the rest of it. I mean, I still, you know, there were some funny moments or whatever, but it didn't have the the same magic that it had at the beginning. I mean, I I I don't even know what what part to pick as my favorite part, but it was like exactly the movie I would write. And if you go back and watch uh, the Good Clean Fun movie that I made about my band, it was actually the exact. I was trying to do the exact same thing, like uh, right. almost almost all jokes I I had tried and failed to do myself, you know. But it was. Yeah, it was like my favorite thing I've seen all year by far, but I didn't really care for the second half. And I not just because it was really mean to Madonna, which was actually kind of funny, but um, yeah, I, I didn't, I felt like it didn't keep up the second half the same way the first half was amazing. Uh, it was my understanding that, that Weird Al, like before the Funny or Die trailer, because they set her up as the villain in the trailer, that I guess that Weird Al like talked to her about it and she thought it was hilarious. So I think she was okay. down. For well, that's, it, so. <laughs> that makes me feel less weird about it, but it was definitely, uh, it was, it was a strange turn for the movie, but like the, the eat it joke and stuff like that kind of stuff is like exactly my kind of humor. Like that's exactly what I want from a Weird Al movie, but it ended up not being as good as UHF. So, you know, yeah, you know, it's Which funny. Is my high initial high. reaction was that I thought that it was better than UHF, but as I think about it over time, UHF, for nothing else, the thinking of something orange, I'm always going to, I guess, you know, <laughs> UHF's going to win. Um, UHF was just full nonstop. It had so much funny stuff in it. Right. 
so yeah that's weird is on my honorable mentions and then my last two honorable mentions uh one is um an la noir film called um emily the criminal which i just watched a couple days ago a lot of these i've watched very recently because i was doing yeah I, I, these are all ones that i haven't even i haven't seen yet we, we, on your whole list i've only seen the weird out one so crazy yeah so emily the criminal is audrey plaza who I really hadn't seen in anything before uh, this season of White Lotus, which is funny. Um, oh, you you haven't seen like I, Community? I just don't think I've seen her in a movie before. Maybe I have. But Wait, not not Community. Sorry, the other show. Um, Parks and Rec. To- Parks and Rec. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really watch Parks and Rec. So. Oh wow, she's great. Yeah. So um, yeah. So Emily the Criminal is a movie where she plays like a kind of down on your luck like woman uh like artist living in LA who has to take odd jobs and then ends up um doing credit card scams in order to um and like slowly gets pulled into like some real nasty stuff and it's a really great LA noir film apparently it was filmed in 20 days which is really fast for a movie and it's funny because she shot that in what she termed as not the nicest parts of LA for 20 days and then went directly to filming the, the, in the resort in Sicily for white Lotus. So (laughs) that's kind of a, quite a culture shock. And, um, but Emily, the criminal has really brutal moments and it, um, but the thing is, is it's a real, it's a real gross atmosphere. And like, I know like my wife, Carrie, she, um said that you know it just the movie kind of grossed her out and she didn't you know like there's not a lot of people to root for in that movie um you'll definitely be rooting for emily and for some of the moments but um but the thing is it's definitely a crime noir and um it's interesting somebody told me somebody who suggested to me told me it was a horror movie and it's definitely not that um okay and you know i like to expand the definitions of horror but that's not one but my last honorable mention is a horror movie and that's um black phone Um, that's on my list actually okay so it's higher on your list so we'll talk about it when we get to um to it on your list so now i'm gonna let's talk about our most overrated movie of the year (laughs) and for me i hope it's not on your list but for me it's the batman it is on my list, but I also almost made it my most overrated movie. So it's both for me. All right, but it so, is it is on my list. So we'll talk about it when we get there. Okay. Uh, do you my have most? most yeah. My most overrated movie was Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. I don't know if you had the. I have not seen it yet, but it, I heard it. It is a- one of. It, it's one of my least favorite movies I've ever seen to the point where I was like about to walk out for almost the whole movie. Like it was. It's it was a it was a great idea executed so poorly that I don't understand how people liked it. Like it was just like I, I don't this won't spoil anything, but there's 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 a scene or a couple scenes where there are these people in a dark room or a dark house, right? Uh next to relatively close to each other, like on the same floor of a house, and it's dark, so they can't see anything. So they use their phones to like light up the area so they can see where they're going or whatever, right? But they're trying to find each other and they can't find each other. Like, have you ever seen a phone in a dark room? You know, like you will not have trouble spotting it. It was just like, it. it, I mean, a lot of it was, it was supposed to be like uh, Gen Z people are kind of stupid or whatever, but it was, it was just so ridiculous that in real life, it was just completely impossible. It really made me angry. I I don't know how else to, uh, to say it but but the the premise was great it was just executed so poorly I, I was shocked but people really liked it which is very strange yeah um would you consider it also the worst crap you saw this year or is that something oh different? absolutely 100 percent the worst crap i saw this year <laughs> and i i guess i could try to come up with something else for the overrated but uh but that was and that hit all my categories of uh, over because people liked it. Although the Batman was also my overrated one, so it was sort of uh, a toss up between the two. Yet it's on your top. But 10. I liked it. I okay. liked it, but it was yes. overrated. Yeah. <laughs> um. So the worst crap I saw this year was um a movie by a director I have great respect for, who I generally who I've liked his first two movies, but 
the north man um oh okay look yep. and look i love conan the barbarian but that conan the barbarian has pace it has gravitas it has like the north man was the most like discombobulated it didn't fit together the story barely moved there was absolutely no one to root for all the characters were ugly and gross and look i know i'm vegan and all that and so like <laughs> like ancient norse world is not going to be like where i would time travel to um if i could but oh my god i could not stand this movie i got through it and the thing that i said like basically when i saw it was that was quite a technical achievement that i couldn't stand and um <laughs> Which is, I can acknowledge that the technical achievement of making this film is really impressive. Alexander Skarsgård went to someplace else for that movie. That's great, but not for me. And um, here's the thing about the movie is that it bombed, sort of. And this is one where I looked at it and was like, who the fuck greenlit this for that budget? Because it was so (laughs) expensive. And Robert Edgar's made The Lighthouse, which is great. And what was his first movie? Um, uh, it was an equally weird movie. Oh, The Witch. Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. This is not the guy you hand a blockbuster budget to. Like, as much as I right. like the guy, I love The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse is a fantastic movie. But the, but he's not, like, I don't know why they greenlit this movie. Like, as from a so studio. this was... This was Northman was on my list of movies where I liked the first half. If you had cut the movie, you know, same thing with weird. If you'd cut the movie when they go to Iceland, I would have been like, damn, this was a cool movie. I can't wait to see all the amazing epic stuff that's about to happen. But then it like took this serious left turn into like maybe the least interesting sounding pitch that I could imagine. Yeah. Like it went from being this like, you you know, I I didn't know anything about it going in. I was expecting some like gladiator level story of like, you know, the, the guy's going to become a slave and then rise up and like whatever, but it ended up being, it just became smaller and smaller. Like they went to this yeah. remote village in Iceland and it just, it was very disappointing, but like, it, it wasn't had, like the, I'm going to get my kingdom back that you thought it was going to be. And it had two actors who are almost surefire for me, like um, Ethan Hawke and uh, Nicole Kidman are surefires for me. I, I love them yeah. in most everything. Oh, like, every, all the acting was fantastic. There was nothing wrong with any of the performances or anything like that. It was just the story just went off the rails. Like the it script. just got less yeah, the script. Speaking yeah. of scripts that yeah. just didn't work. My no, myth- I don't even mean the script. Well, hold, hold on. I don't mean that the script wasn't good. I mean, the story got bad. Like, that it is the should script, have been. though, in a film. Well, but, That's but, where you well, saw yeah, the sure. story. No. Well, okay, fair enough. But what I mean is that, like, it wasn't, like, a poorly written script. It was the decision of what the story should be that the problem was. Like, if he had, it, to me at least, I would have thought that it would have been, because it starts off, he's lost, he's been cheated out of his kingdom. What happens in movies when you're cheated out of your kingdom? You kill the bad guy and take your kingdom back, right? That's what you're right. supposed to do. The kingdom's not supposed to be taken over by some third party off screen and you just hear about it and then you do some like family bullshit, you know, like that was a, just a really strange decision because it was so up until then, I thought. Yeah, and just a really ugly, ugly world. So like if you don't give me a good story, then, you know, and like uh, like the whole time my thought during watching The Northman and I watched it at home, so it wasn't like I was in the theater, but the whole time I just kept thinking, why am I not watching Conan? <laughs> why didn't I just watch Conan again? <laughs> I would have had a much better experience. And, um, but yeah, but so uh, do you have a most disappointing movie of the year besides? Bob so this Bob? one is, this one's kind of funny because, so it's The Invitation, which was, uh, it was kind of a low, but it was a low budget looking horror movie um, about vampires. And it was actually, great until the vampire showed up like it was like surprisingly really good i was like oh my god this is shockingly good and then the one part of a vampire movie which you would think would be the easiest is like have some vampires show up and do some cool vampire stuff they totally failed on that part and the vampires pretty much just 
are complete pushovers who pretty much instantly die. And you're just like, are you kidding? Like they built up this whole like fear and control thing for the whole movie. And then it just turned into nothing. It was very, very disappointing. Um, but I recommend it because the the beginning was really good. All right. So my miss, most disappointing, and I should have known better. I shouldn't have been disappointed about this, but I got on the hype train and I thought they hired the right director because they got the director of The Ritual, which I thought was a good underrated horror movie. And uh, David Goyer was a producer and I like David Goyer as a producer. Um, and he produced one of the movies in my top 10. But um, the new Hellraiser movie was really bad. It was really bad. Yeah, I didn't even... yeah, and here's the thing. The casting was good. The design was good. The design of the Cenobites was great. And in all the interviews leading up to the release of the movie, the director said all the right things about mm-hmm. like how you know we're going back to the source material and we, we want to get the vibe of and, and the script was a mess. And there were ways that as I you know a movie's bad when I'm spending the whole time rewriting it. And right. the whole time I was like, no, this is what you could have done. You could have done this. And if you started at this point and you did this and you cut out this character and you did that. Also, it takes place in New York and it was filmed in Belgrade. And you can really tell they did not do a good job of, of shooting for another, con- you know, doing that stuff. Right. Um Oh, it's New York. Who knows what New York looks like, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they released it to Hulu and they didn't get a theatrical release. It was really interesting watching the discourse come out because people really wanted to like it and there were lots of parts of it. Mm-hmm. Now, one of the things that was really hilarious about the reaction was they they cast Jamie Clayton from Sense8 to play the new Pinhead, who is a trans actor, and the the idea that people that there were certain people that were outraged that Pinhead had, had a gender at all was really hilarious because people well, first that. of all Pinhead was a woman <laughs> in in the original novella but regardless right David Bradley was Pinhead in the original Hellraiser because he was an old theater buddy of Clive Barker's who he trusted mm-hmm. to sit still in the makeup <laughs> right. <laughs> so it was the only reason why we had male pain head to begin with so look um, and if ser- seriously is that if anyone thinks that it matters for for pinhead of all things you know what i mean like come on yeah it's ridiculous okay yeah. so uh now this next uh uh arena is going to be not good not a good movie but i liked it anyways um <laughs> And I will start, and you can do two or three, four, whatever. Anyways, um, and my first one is Day Shift, uh, the vampire movie starring uh, Jamie Foxx and Snoop Dogg. I, I did not see that, and that sounds like a movie I would see. I don't even remember that coming out. <laughs> it, it was straight to Netflix, but... Um, okay, that's, that's why I didn't see it. Yeah, and um, this movie is ridiculous, in all the right ways, it's definitely inspired by Big Trouble in Little China and going for that vibe. It was directed by a stuntman. Um, they used contortionists um, in a way that has never been used on in stunts before to make the vampires like insane and weird and creepy. And it looks like it's CGI, but it's not. It's contortionist, um, which is really cool. And they had to develop and trademark a... a a way of filming them in order to make the special effects work. So it was very cool. Um, mm-hmm. And only a stunt man could have done that in directing. And it's one of the, he's a guy who worked with like Chad St- Stahelski and all those guys, the John Wick dudes. And it's his first movie as a director. Um, and I got a dog barking. Um, but uh, I will see that. Yeah. And um Next up um, on my, it's not good. Well, this movie is good. However, you'll see, I'll explain why it's on this list. And that's, um, and it's, it's, it's on Peacock for streaming is, is um, Cop Shop by Joe Carnahan. Um, did you see Cop Shop at all? I, I did not. 
Cop Shop it stars Gerard Butler. So there's your, you know. Okay. Um, I, I like him. I he I enjoy. Him. I like Gerard Butler too. And yeah. um, uh, Cop Shop is a is like one of those like COVID movies where they filmed early in lockdown, where they tried to have like a condensed story and everything. Um, the year before my my movie of the year last year, if you recall, was Joe Carnahan directed one of them one of my top movies of the year was boss level by joe carnahan last year mm-hmm. joe carnahan smart smoking aces the gray um whatever anyways he made this movie cop shop which is about which is kind of like a goofy retelling of assault on precinct 13 in a, in, in, a, in a weird way um it's very funny it's way better than it should be it punches way over its weight um the thing is the studio took away control at the end of the movie and they made him add a scene at the end um Mm -hmm. and it kind of ruins the movie um and he's done interviews where he's basically explained and the way he says it is we had a freaking a a comedy action masterpiece and they ruined it um and he's very bitter about it and um it's funny because when i watched the movie i was like right up to the end i was like holy shit this is so good this is math this is fucking great it's so underrated why aren't people talking about this and then the ending came and took a big steaming poop on the rest of the movie <laughs> um so uh unfortunately there's not a really clear delineating line where you could just say just turn it off because right. they didn't get the end of the the story the way they wanted it so that's okay. cop shop by joe carnahan but i still recommend it i still think run to peacock if you've got peacock and watch cop shop you will laugh it's very funny it's very violent um very hilarious um dialogue uh very good excuse me um and my last um well this movie is good but it's also like one where I I don't know if I can recommend the experience, um, and that's uh, David Cronenberg's Return to Science Fiction in uh, Crimes of the Future. Did you see this? I I didn't see that one. I've been meaning to see that, but I haven't gotten to it yet. Okay, uh, Viggo Mortensen was recovering from an injury, so like he couldn't even stand up for long periods of time, which is which a- ends up like adding this weird thing to it, um, and because david cronenberg apparently won't make a movie without vigo now um <laughs> and uh uh this is definitely david cronenberg return to form although we have his son like basically carrying the, the weird body horror mantle very well now um the crimes of the future is also very long and kind of boring um not for me i wasn't bored I loved every minute of it, but as I was watching it, I knew most people would be bored watching it. Uh, And so that's why it's here on my list, because I can't objectively say it's a top 10 movie because it does have pacing issues. I didn't care, but um, sometimes I don't mind a slow movie, but I can't objectively say it's a good movie. So, um, Isa, what are your? It's not good, but I liked it anyways. So the one that that I have to go with is Black Adam. Uh, you know, I'm a superhero guy. I like superhero movies. Um, Black Adam was it was a mess. Like there were about four thousand plots happening at the same time, and they really got in the way of the couple that were really good. And, and it's just, it's a mystery to me why this seems to happen a lot with DC movies. Um, you know, whatever. I, I'm not trying to be some like Marvel, DC, whatever. But the DC movies tend to be like, you just wonder why they weren't, they aren't better, you know? And and Black Adam could have easily, easily been a great movie. And, yeah, and like they even, yeah, I mean, you won't like it, you know? <laughs> like you might, I don't know, but it's just it's one of those things it's like the rock is a superhero you 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 nothing should go wrong after that you know what i mean but someone decided they needed some some like weird backstory here some other backstory here and and they didn't just focus on the actual pretty good backstory that they had that the trailer spoilers but that was actually a pretty cool cool story um so yeah it was enjoyable it was fun it was definitely like an hour too long but it was uh it was good 
Wow, an hour too long. <laughs> <laughs> Including the after credit scene. And it also has an after credit scene that's better than the whole movie. So you're sort of like, why didn't they just make that movie instead? You know, whatever. Okay, it was very so no, so no more. So that's your only not good, but I liked it anyways. I mean, I kind of uh I kind of debated a couple other movies. I kind of want to throw Thor, Love and Thunder on that list because I really didn't like it. I mean, I I liked it. It was enjoyable to see, but it was it was pretty bad. Like, I mean, in terms of like what you expect from Marvel, it was definitely not up to standard. <laughs> and uh it, it I would even say that it's it's one it's the worst Marvel movie ever made, I would say. Um, which is strange because the last yeah, I'm movie curious to see it just because I have heard that it's like that yeah. it is the, the worst Marvel movie. It is, it went like Ragnarok, the the previous Thor movie was like just silly enough. Like it straddled the line between serious movie and silly. There were a couple things where you were like, are they gonna get too silly here? No, no, they kept it just silly enough. And then the new movie is just 20 times sillier to the point where you're just like can't believe how silly it is all right well um yeah i i know i want to see it at some point but i think i think they just uh gave taika maybe a little too much freedom that time i think so too. <laughs> yeah which is interesting because he's supposedly going to make a star wars movie and i don't know if that's a good idea but probably not a good idea <laughs> he did direct a good episode of the Mandalorian, and he stayed in the lines so yeah yeah all right um so your number 10 movie let's start our top 10 my number 10 movie is the black phone which i believe is on your list um, sorry about that uh yeah so um do you want to talk about first why you like black phone and then I'll is it your number 10 no it's not my number 10 it was on my uh my honorable mentions Oh, oh, right. I forgot. Okay. So uh, it was, I, I went in knowing nothing about it. Um, I was expecting a pretty low budget movie that wasn't going to be very good. And it was surprisingly good. Like it was very simple, but it really did a good job with what it had. And uh, I ended up really enjoying it. Um, all right. So my thing on Black Phone, first of all, I've read the story before. And the joke, the story was written by Joe Hill's son of Stephen King, Joe Hill. Um, and uh, the story is very short and there's not much to it. Um, there is the phone, there is the kidnapped kid in the basement. But um, I think Black Phone is a really great example of where they expanded on a story and made it better. And like they added... Scott Derrickson made it very personal. Like he kind of made it autobiographical about his childhood and mixed it with the story and the source material. And um, for people who say that the book is always better, the stories, the source material is always better. Uh, this is a great example where the um, movie is significantly better than the source material. The story is like almost like a punchline. It's very short. There's not much to it. Um, so I thought Ethan Hawke was super great and creepy. Um, I've been on record as saying that I love Ethan Hawke. I just did it 20 minutes ago. I think he's really great. Um, I think last year his performance in Good Lord Bird is one of the most underrated performances in any medium over the last couple of years. So I think he's been on a um he's been on a tear. I think Scott Derrickson and C. Robert Cargill um just did, just killed it on the screenplay. And Cargill uh, wrote one of my favorite books of the last couple of years. So like, you know, I'm rooting for him. And uh, he wrote um, two science fiction books, um, Sea of Rust and Day Zero, that are super underrated. And so I just want to shout those out. But yeah, Black Phone was great. Um, creepy yeah. horror movie. Very good. Uh, you have anything else on it? that's it i you know you know all the details of every movie and i just like the movie <laughs> you know? yeah. i'm like we saw a movie it was good <laughs> okay so there my number 10 is the only movie that has a writer that has a movie on my top 10 uh movies of the year and a book on my top 10 books wow. of the year and um this is kimmy the um Steven Soderbergh movie written by David Kep, 
who is one of my favorite uh, writers in general. Um, he is, for people who don't know, he directed, wrote and directed Stir of Echoes. He's the screenwriter of the Sam Raimi Spider-Man, Jurassic Park, uh, Panic Room. Um, Sorry, the movie's called Kimmy? I've never heard of it. Kimmy, starring um, oh, um, Lisa Bonet's daughter. What's um, Zoe Kravitz. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, uh, directed by Steven Soderbergh, uh, who I'm sure you know who St- Steven Soderbergh is. And it was one of those, another one of those COVID movies where they just try, you know. Um, and so the thing about it is David Kep, if you've ever seen um, Stir of Echoes or Panic Room, uh, you know that he's really good at building suspense out of geography and story beats and really. And so Kimmy is a paranoid thriller. And so um, Zoe Kravitz plays this um, kind of paranoid um, uh, woman who's working from home who as it believes that like um, the system is out to get her and the company that she works for there's this kind of conspiracy thing going on and it's it's really subtle good it's very subtle good um, and uh, it's a movie that I've seen hardly anyone talk about in the last year uh, it got released I think to HBO Max uh, okay. See, yeah. I, I miss all these straight to streaming movies. I, I have all these streaming services, but I, I don't uh, hear about the movies. And uh, if, if if it's not like a buzz, I don't see it usually. So yeah. So um, I highly recommend it. Um, Zoe Kravitz is hilarious in this movie. She plays um, a very strange, paranoid character, and we laughed a lot uh, at really subtle moments in her performance. So um, it's worth seeing. So um, Issa, you're number nine. Number nine, I have Smile, uh, the horror movie that came out uh, not too long ago. Have not uh, seen it. Okay, it's uh, it's one of those horror, it, it was, uh, it, it's not the most original horror movie you've ever seen. It's like uh, the evil's getting passed from person to person and we've got to do something, you know? But it was really well done. Uh, I keep hearing and- that. Yeah. Yeah. Really well done. Really good. Um, yeah. There's not really too much else to say about it. It's not like uh, I wouldn't call it like super groundbreaking or anything like some like another horror movie that's higher up on my list. But there's some foreshadowing. Um, but uh, it was it was very good. And I, I definitely recommend it. Yeah. Um, what I do know about it is that it was made for a very low budget and it was a yeah. huge hit and it set off a kind of tidal wave of like we need more horror movies because yeah uh it did so well in the theater in a way at a time when nothing but maverick was doing well so like um and so people were like you know we need horror movies quick and uh you know it's weird because i don't know if that's going to translate into some good stuff or bad stuff or what I feel like we should just quickly touch on, you know, for people, historians, years from now, looking back on this uh, podcast, um, you know, we should really say that this is like a very strange time for movies just coming out of the pandemic. Um, everything's a little weird because of yeah. that. So it's it's just important to mention that for, you know, again, for those future historians. Yeah, of course. Uh, my number nine is, um, excuse me, on the often but uh is alienoid the korean uh blockbuster uh um this is a sci-fi wushu crossover um and it has it's a time travel movie with lots of cgi but it has a modern a modern part of the story with an alien invasion storyline and then time travel to thir- 13th, 14th century Korea. And so half of the movie is like super high tech sci fi, like North, where like this alien comes to North Korea or to South Korea and is like has to stop this like body horror, like body snatcher invasion thing. And then but that 
the lead alien gets somehow sent back in time. And it's almost like two complete movies and it's two hours and 22 minutes long. And it's like, there's a complete like sci-fi movie and there's a complete wuxia movie. Um, and they're both good, but the wuxia movie is a little better. The wuxia movie <laughs> is hilarious because first of all, there are these two sorcerers who are aces these two sorcerers are so funny. You every scene they're in, they're hilarious. But there's also like this, there's this other magician who has like a fan that he keeps these that has cats on it. Whenever he unleashes the or does the fan a certain way, they turn into guys that fight for him. It's a weird, <laughs> weird movie. Is it to me, it's a top 10 movie because it's just bonkers. It's just absolutely okay. bonkers. It's a little long. It's almost like two movies. And then it ends on a cliffhanger and uh, part two next year, which we don't get till 2023 released. And in- is that going to be two, two more movies of completely different genres? <laughs> I don't know, but it's still ruled. It was still great. I think the Wuxia movie was was a little better, and I'm telling you, those two sorcerers are worth the price of admission. All right, I will I will have to see that one. It, and um, the uh, yeah, the sci-fi stuff is is very weird. The alien <laughs> has like the main character, the main the lead actor, like he has like this robot that floats around that can turn into other versions of him. So there's like it'll turn into like it's the same actor, but he's playing like the cool guy version where he's wearing like aviator shades and like a weird outfit. And and it's just the foot is the weirdest movie I saw all year. So I just got to give it, you got to give it props for that. So alienoid, the, uh, Korea is it's, um, my highest ranked, um, Asian film this year, which is, uh saying something actually it's the only one on my list which is really weird um i did see some other cool ones the roundup from korea was great and i saw a bad i do want to give a shout out to it's called warriors of future not warriors of the future but there's a hong kong movie called warriors of future which is a bad it's another one of those bad movies it's a bad movie but it was fascinating it was like giant (laughs) mechs fighting like giant plant monsters from Hong Kong. Mm. But the thing that was so interesting about that movie was I kept thinking about what were the Chinese censors thinking when they were watching this because (laughs) climate change is real in this future. And then there's like a guy who's working for the government, but they never say that it's the future Chinese government, but then he like is all about money. And so it was very weird, like to think about what China thought of that movie. So so I did see I did see some Asian films this year that because uh, usually there's more of them on the on the list. But so uh, you're number eight, Isa. No, number eight, and we don't have to spend too much time talking about this one. But my number eight was the Batman. Um, and my main oh, we'll, we'll talk main, about it. Yeah, okay. The main reason I have it on the list, you know, taken on its own. I've every time I've done this with you, I've left Marvel movies out because usually there's like three or four Marvel movies a year. And those are usually my one, two, three places. So this year was a little different. The Marvel movies weren't as good as usual. Um, But I easily, I definitely enjoyed both Dr. Strange and Black Panther more, much more than the Batman. But I feel that for a DC movie and for, for like the, you know, Batman movie number, what, 17 now, I don't honestly don't even know what number it is, but it's, I'm not, I might not be exaggerating. Uh, I thought it was pretty exciting. Like, it was good. It definitely could have been a lot shorter. A lot of stuff could have been done differently. <laughs> but f- all things considered, I really enjoyed it. Um, All right. So this was my most overrated movie of the year. And I got to say, I went yeah. to the Batman. And, and I, I agree on that. Totally. I went to the Batman with my homie Nate, who, by the way, has three Batman hats. He has an in, probably two weeks worth of Batman t-shirts in his wardrobe. So just for the record, that's who I went to see Batman with. And he hated it. And it was weird really? because when it was going on, I kept thinking to myself, well, I'm not liking this, but Nate's probably having a ball sitting next to me. 
<laughs> and when it was over, he was like, that was awful. Um, he was, you know, all those people that thought that Last Jedi didn't do Star Wars right or whatever. That yeah. was Nate with, with the Batman. He did not like some of the character choices. And that's not my problem with it. Right. My problem with it was for a solid two hours, I was thinking, this is a really good Batman movie. This is a yeah. really good serial killer movie. And then the last hour, I just was wanting it to end. And it was so long. <laughs> it was so long. There was no reason so for this movie. For no reason. Yeah, there was no reason for it to be that long. It would have been way better, an hour shorter. It really could have been an hour shorter. There is a movie on our list that I'm sure you can guess that has similar runtime. Yes. <laughs> and I never got bored in that movie. And I never got... I I... I got bored in this movie. So um that that is that. Um so that's and, it for my number. I feel like we've we you know there everyone's gonna have their opinion on a Batman movie, you know. Yeah, no, and I appreciated some of the stylistic choices that Matt Reeves made. And um, you know, I think that there are some things um, you know, you know, I don't know. I mean, there's things that I think are good about it, and I'll definitely see a sequel if he does it but um i'm still a nolan batman guy i i i like the first two nolans a lot Uh, the third one i can eh, but i I I, so my favorite batman was the adam west movie um i really have never liked any of the batman after that um you know dark knight was fine uh the, the heath ledger one was especially good um but the third one was so terrible that i you know, it, it, it just, those didn't really do anything for me. I, I, I wasn't ex- excited. Like, I think Batman is such a cheesy, campy character and it works so well in like the Adam West era. And then whenever you try to take it seriously, I'm not loving it. But I did like the detective, the detective Batman of the Batman. You know, I appreciate if you, if you, that if you shortened and rewrote that movie a little, it would have been really good. The Riddler was good. Uh, the yeah. Robert Pattinson was good. You know, it had it had some silly stuff like why did we have to get the penguin all you know, why did we have to dress Colin Farrell like that? Like that that part was kind of like whatever. But um, you know, it was good. But then I know a lot of people out there are like, Oh, did you see the car? And I'm I'm never gonna be the guy that likes a movie just because a car was cool or not. You know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah. Story needs to stand on its own, regardless of how cool the toys are or whatever. So yeah. All right, so my number eight is another straight to Netflix movie, and I tried to tell you to watch it. I don't know if you did, but and that is Metal Lords. Um, I did not watch that. <laughs> okay, I, I I especially want to know what you think of Metal Lords. For so Metal Lords is like kind of a cute, kind of teenage, um, kind of coming of age movie. It's it's not like a teenage rom com because it's. But anyways, it's about these guys who start, who are like picked on and like they're bullied at their high school in Portland, Oregon. And all they want to do is start a metal band. And so there's this kid who's like the guitarist and he's the ultra metal kid. He knows everything about metal. And the main character is who looks like Daniel Radcliffe when he was young is his drummer and in the beginning of the movie he doesn't even like metal but he's the only drummer he has and then the kid like becomes like the metal actually it is a rom-com because he yeah okay i forgot there is a romantic part to it but anyways just anyone out there who wants to write a movie that david will like base it in portland or indiana (laughs) yeah it's guaranteed (laughs) well anyways like um this is a movie about bullies and high school and metal and and it's very cute and you wouldn't think a movie about a bunch of metlers ah would be cute but I think it I thought it was cute um it you know just like everything these days it may have been it may have had a few minutes that were it's not that the movie was too long because it wasn't super long it's just I mean there were some parts I would have rewritten that it would have would have changed it's not perfect but um being a metal guy one of the reasons why i'm curious what you would think is that i'm a metal dude so i of course li- liked that premise but you don't like metal i do so not. <laughs> you don't you're a hardcore kid that 
didn't grow up on metal. So exactly. I'm curious kind of what you would you would think of of this movie and whether it works for you. And um and actually, if there's any movie on the list tonight that I would be like, Isa, watch tonight. Um, it would be Metal Lords because mostly just because I'm curious what you would think of it. So, okay, I'll I'll try to get to that one. You know, um, I have to do. <laughs> yeah, smart dogs. Carrie's making smart smart dogs. She just wanted everyone to know that. Guys, nice. Carrie watched Metal Lords <laughs> no, with me. I I, I have I, to do some. Uh, I have to do some prodigy watching apparently. So, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, we're delaying that one. So yeah, you, you have some time. I, I have some other, yeah, I have, I have a lot to, you make me watch a lot of TV. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> Luckily well, I uh, enjoy it all. Yeah. So uh, Issa, you're number seven. Number seven is a really good one. I really am excited to talk about vengeance. Uh, it's That's by... my number seven. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> No way. <laughs> we both have number like, seven. I bet BJ Novak set out to make a movie and was like, I hope that everyone reviews this as their number seven, seven movie. movie. Yeah. I did it, you know. Um, man, that was really good. Like it yeah. was uh it I again I went in not really knowing anything about it. Um and I really enjoyed it. All the performances were good, it was a nice little story, it was surprising in in its uh you know, very timely. And uh, it was the first place that I'd heard people use the slang 100%, which has now become like the most popular thing to say. Um, so that was kind of funny to me. Um, really, that's yeah, funny because in Syracuse, we always used to say 200%. Or something was <laughs> really, that was a, that was a Carl uh, Earth Crisis, Carl Beekner line uh, to say 200%. Yeah. <laughs> no, Vengeance. <laughs> so for people who don't know, Ven <laughs> excuse me. Um, I, did you get a theatrical release? You saw it in the theater, right? I saw it in the theater, yeah. Yeah, uh, but it's now streaming on Peacock. It was designed to end up on Peacock, I um, I believe, because it's a universal movie. And it's B.J. Novak, who's kind of one of the side actors from The Office, um, wrote and directed it. And uh, he said that the joke of it was is that um, he, he was at some film festival and there was some movie that that they were trying to get funding for, for distribution for, and it had the it said vengeance, like really big on it. And his friends said, what would a, he's like, can you imagine yourself on a poster with the word vengeance and kind of laughed at him. And then he was like, he's like, well, well what would be a movie that I write that's called vengeance. And what I will say about vengeance, if you, to, to, to kind of tell people whether they want to see it or not, vengeance is the most Coen brothers, non Coen brothers movie i've ever seen it, it, it's a not great it's that's not a really as finely tuned as a Coen brothers movie but it has the kind of tone and feeling of a Coen brothers movie it has some violence it has a lot of really awkward humor it has really interesting characters um and it's really compelling and you'll and like you'll find yourself being like really hooked into it. So yeah, vengeance. Yeah, it's also it's a it's an excellent, maybe one of the best fish out of water stories I've seen in a long time. Like really, really well done. Like the New York kid in Texas, that was handled really well, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. And um great um supporting performance from the woman that plays Jerry on um succession, um uh, <laughs> uh as the the mom of the of the family. Uh, she was really, really good. I don't know that actor's name, but um, but I had the when we were watching it, I was like, yeah, it's Jerry from Succession. So, um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so yeah, that hey, we got number seven totally out of the way. Great. Yeah. Um, your number six, Isa. My number six is a great movie, and it is The Menu. Um, I hope you saw this. Did you did you see the menu? I have not seen this. I uh, the okay. the vegan in me was uh was afraid to see the menu, but you're vegan, so and you yeah, it's it, it's so. definitely gross, but uh, but in a it worked, it worked really well. Um, uh, yeah, it's definitely gross, <laughs> but it did. It was a really good movie, um, and. You know, in in this okay, this will be good because this isn't a spoiler and it lets me talk about it a little bit. But you know, the funny thing is, is a lot of the movie is just a send up of like of like foodie culture, and, which I hate. Yeah, yeah, and of course, and it's just so hilarious that like 
you know, there are people who will just go to these ridiculous lengths to eat these crazy things. And it's just like, you can have a absolutely delicious meal that like, you know, doesn't kill anything. <laughs> it's like not cruel, you know? And it's just, it's just crazy that people will put in so much effort to like eat something that's like, you know, literally taking the life of another being. And, and that's not the point of this movie at all. But if, you know, just whenever you see a movie about food, that kind of comes up. But this is a, a horror movie-ish. Not, eh, hor- it's psychological thriller, I guess, is probably better than horror movie. Although it's it's got a little bit of, of a lot of stuff in it. Um, yeah, but it's, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but it, I highly recommend it. it. It's very entertaining and surprising. All right. So my number six is Nope uh, by Jordan Peele. And um, the thing about it is that I kind of vacillated, like it kind of moved up and down my list. And for like a long time, it was like lower. Um, But, and as far as Jordan Peele movies go, I, I personally think us is his best movie and, and not everyone liked that one. (laughs) Um, And uh I it, it was hilarious to me when us came out and people were trying to rationally explain what was obviously a surreal movie, <laughs> right. um, you know, and uh, meant to be surreal and not, there's no logic to us, you know, whereas Nope is a movie that I loved that he was doing kind of close encounters, like a spielberg type thing. Um I'm not sure that I think this movie is the horror movie that people think it is because I think, no, it's not really. And um, um, I think it's a very subtle movie in a lot of ways, like that it's not over the top in its messaging. I loved uh, what's his name? The guy from uh, the crow who had the like small role. There was the guy trying to get the perfect shot The um, he was incredible. (laughs) in it i don't know his name um but um i i well yeah he was the guy who fired the gun that killed brandon lee by the way um but uh uh, that should not be the thing that defines him but he was great (laughs) he was great in um in nope and i yeah i just i just really thought it had a i liked how different of a movie it was now a lot of people will say like oh it's a very different alien ufo type movie but is that what we saw i love that we don't really know we don't like was it a being from another dimension was it a alien what was it technology we don't really know and um one of the things that i liked about that movie was that jordan peele didn't explain too much um he left the mystery there and i appreciated that so yeah no so- Nope did not work for me. I I wanted to like it so bad. I would say that like, like I thought if I was the Jordan Peele movies, I want to love them. Get Out was perfect. Like I, I if I was, if I was, I feel like each movie is just less good. <laughs> like, I don't know. I feel really mean saying this because I really want to like it. Us was fine. I enjoyed it, but it was like nowhere near as good as Get Out. And then Nope was like nowhere near as good as us. And I just feel like it's been like straight downhill. And I know I don't know if I can exactly put my finger on why. There were parts of the movie that I liked, but mostly I was bored. And I kind of didn't really like what the characters were doing, if that makes sense. Like, like it they weren't acting like the way a way that I thought people would act. And and what was really telling to me was probably the most exciting scene in the movie to me aside from the akira motorcycle slide probably the most exciting scene in the movie to me was when he's in the barn and you see the aliens right and that wasn't what it was at all but that that was the direction i would have preferred by far uh and i don't you know not even like i was thinking oh i wish this movie had done x y and z because it wasn't really that kind of criticism it was just like this was a pretty cool movie but it didn't really do anything for me yeah, the only thing I I I I think Jordan Peele's done. I like that he's reinvented himself as a horror director. It's great, or yeah. you know, as a director at all. Um, the only thing he's done that I really really thought was terrible was his Twilight Zone reboot. He, the 
he totally failed at that. And he failed at I, that you because know, the essential thing, tough. the essential thing that he got wrong with the Twilight Zone is that he hired a bunch of TV writers. And the mm-hmm. Twilight Zone was always genre writers. It was Richard Matheson. It was Charles Beaumont. It was Michael or George Clayton Johnson. And he hired people whose experience were like the office and, you know, and then, and I guess said like, Hey, make the twilight zone. And it showed and it was terrible. It was awful. And so that's the only thing I I actually thought he did. I, you know, he only produced Lovecraft country. I liked Lovecraft country. I, you know, I think he's done good stuff, but I understand where you could, I could see where you're coming from on it, but personally, I like, you know, it's it's weird and and I I don't uh I it's hard to know exactly what's going on but I feel like you know if he was a band because I, I feel like I understand musicians better than I understand directors or whatever but yeah there are bands that like work really hard to make it you know to make it they've been touring they've been perfecting their set list writing all the songs for years and years and they get their first shot at making a major label album and they have all this great material and their first album is just fantastic and then it's a huge success and the label's like okay we need that next album and they don't have anything left right like they they maybe have like okay let's use the songs that we didn't pick on the first album that were that almost made it let's write some new ones and you end up with a second album that's not as good now they're on tour more the album's selling anyway because people still like the first album then it's time for that third album and they literally don't have any of those original songs left nothing to work with and, and i'm not saying that that's what's happened to jordan peel i have no idea i would love I to meet I, the guy and talk to him he's a fantastic director but i feel like the material just hasn't been there like uh, i'm excited i bet he'll make another fantastic movie but i didn't think that nope was it yeah, I didn't like Nope as much as us, so I will, I will agree in in that sense. Um, so that was my number six. But, but you know, like even saying that, I just have to say something really good about Jordan Peele too, because I really think he's a fantastic director. Like whatever, whatever I didn't like about Nope, it was definitely not the direction. It was more of a uh, just the way the story went. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, hold on one second. um all right so that was number six so you've done your number six so we gotta oh wait am i it's your, yeah. i think we're on your number six right yeah we're oh on... no that was your that, that was, was your my number. number six so your number five yeah. my number five is barbarian which uh was another horror movie uh is that on your list oh okay so have you no, seen it? it's not on my list but i did like it I did like it. Oh, okay. All right. I was, again, you know, went in not knowing what it was going to be. It was a pretty cool formula for a movie. Like it definitely, uh, it definitely took some turns you weren't expecting to the point where, where you're like, wait a minute, did they just turn off the movie I was watching and put on a completely different movie? Cause I don't know what's happening, but it worked out great. And uh, I was, I was just really impressed with the format um, and the pacing and the way, the way they told it. It wasn't like, the greatest horror movie you've ever seen or anything, but it was definitely a fresh take. And I, I really liked that. Yeah. Um, I liked barbarian. I think um, some of the final 10, 15 minutes, like yeah. hurt the movie because it yeah. just kind of went did. on a little <laughs> bit too long and then kind of stretched. Well, yeah, it's a big spoiler. Yeah. So I don't want, I don't want to get into the yeah. thing that was, it got a little too generic horror movie at the end. Yeah um the first yeah the i the twist the all all that the 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 mid movie twist sorry doggies um (laughs) uh sorry folks uh, out there listening if that got in your headphones will uh um anyways uh the thing about barbarian for me was that um i like there was a lot of like, oh, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't go back down there. I wouldn't go back in that, you know. And so that's why I wasn't a little higher for me. I did think it was a good horror movie and I did think it was a good twist. So and all that. So but I do have a horror movie at number five. And I cheated because this is a 2021 movie, sort of. Uh-oh. 
Uh, now here's why I cheated. Now I'm going to explain <laughs> myself. This movie was um, sometimes movies have contracts now because of the whole streaming thing that directors will make a deal and say like, I'll do this movie. Th this is the amount I'm going to get, but you have to put it in theaters. It has to okay. go in theaters. So mm -hmm. this movie had a, it has to go in theaters contract when it was filmed in 2018. <laughs> okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> right. And was, had trailers playing. It I saw the trailer at the last movie I saw in the theater before COVID. When I went to see The Lodge, that's how long ago um, they were showing trailers for this. And it was really, it was supposed to come out in like April of 2020 and got pushed back. It And its theatrical release in 2021 was like 30 screens across the country and then got released on Hulu in 2022 and so if you look up the movie, sometimes it'll say 20, like on Hulu, it says 2022. And, but technically- I will, I will allow it. <laughs> okay. So this is my excuse. Uh, the movie is Antlers. Um, um, it's a horror movie by Scott Cooper, who's known for doing Crazy Heart. The, um, the dude does country Western movie with Jeff Bridges. And he's not a horror movie guy, but it was produced by David Goyer and Guillermo del Toro. So you've got some pretty high-powered horror um, directors. Antlers is takes place in um, Pacific Northwest in the fall in Oregon. And the movie looks beautiful and is super damp. And like the cinematography is incredible. The monster work is incredible. Um, and it's a monster movie but very character driven with Carrie Russell from the Americans. Um, yeah. Carrie Russell from the Americans is in it. And um, Jesse Plemons plays her brother. And it's very much about like um, abusive families and redneck stuff. And it looks great and it's freaky and it's a good monster movie. And yeah, so that's Antlers. That's my number uh, four. I think we're on four. Right? I, re I remember wanting to see that. And I just, I guess I never uh, realized it had actually dropped on streaming. I'll have to, I'll have to watch it at some point. Now, so part of one of the reasons why I didn't watch it until recently was because um, a couple people that I know saw it and said it was boring and though it is a character slow burn horror movie but um these are probably like a lot of the same people who said it comes at night was a was a terrible was not a horror movie and that's one of my favorite horror movies of the last 10 years so i liked antlers it's a cheat a little bit but it is one of the best movies i watched this year so um yeah. it's my number four actually um, okay. so we've done your four, so we're doing number three now, right? Wait, no, right. we, we skipped, uh, we skipped four. We, that oh. was five. Okay. So I did, I had Barbarian is five and I think, uh, and then know. I did four. So it's your number four. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, okay. So my, my top four, I kind of feel like you could flip a coin and put them in any order, but this is the order I ended up with. Uh, number four, I have, she said, which was, so good i can't even uh i don't even know where to begin performances were great story was great the topic was handled really well everything about it was fantastic great movie uh yeah just just you should see it every if you, anyone who hasn't seen it should immediately go see it um you know it's it's uh, you know it's a good investigative journalism investigative journalist movie regardless of the topic but then it's also very timely and just go see it that's my recommendation and for those who don't know, she said is about the journalists for the New York Times that were working the Harvey Weinstein case. Um, and uh, it's interesting because, you know, uh, Ronan Farrow was kind of at the same time doing the same story. So it's interesting that it's a movie about the, the breaking of a story that kind of sort of got broken by another journalist, too. But that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> What, yeah, what, no, they they did. What, they handled. They covered that pretty well, I think. Yeah, they they did cover that happening a little bit in the movie, but 
what really the movie is about is about the journalists who were really trying to get to break the silence that led to the Me Too movement. And um, Ashley Judd is really good playing herself. <laughs> um, and uh, she's the only one of the actors who kind of agreed to play themselves. So like, that you know, we don't have Gwyneth Paltrow or like, you know, uh rose mcgowan in their roles but you know that's okay it's fine um uh it's uh a good it's a very good movie yeah all, kind of a, all the president's men type of you know movie about journalism so if you like that or spotlight or those kinds of it's very much like that so so that was your number four i did my number four antlers uh your number three isa Okay, my number three, and again, you could have mixed these up, but everything, everywhere, all at once. All right, that's um, my number. That's coming up later. Oh, okay. <laughs> we're going to talk about one you wanted to talk about for my number three. Okay. Uh, that, do you want to tell us? Yeah, that? it's okay. three thousand years of longing. Uh, oh, nice. okay. directed by George Miller, starring Iris Elba and Tilda Swinton, and um, it's one of the rare ones on this list that I actually saw in the theater this year. Wow. Um, and I'm yeah I'm the one I'm one of the five who saw it in the theater <laughs> um there wasn't very many of us who went to see it in the theater um listen uh George Miller earned my ticket basically to anything else that he does after Fury Road I just you know at this point like with Fury Road he earned me going to everything else um and uh so I my feelings on 3000 years of longing was that, okay, so it's the story of a woman who gets a genie in, out of a bottle and she's uh, an expert in myths. And I thought it was a really fun movie. It was really weird and sweet at times. Idris Elba was really interesting in the movie Tilda Swinton was really interesting in the movie. If I don't think if you had two other actors, the movie would work. It was yeah, almost totally. yeah, it it barely worked as it was, but it worked enough that I put it as number three on my list because it was. I'm, I'm surprised. I'm surprised it's so high on your list. I I liked it a lot. I thought it fell apart at the end a little. Kind of was too long and didn't know how to end. Um, but I loved my favorite part about it was that it was that like. People don't really make movies like that anymore, like that, like uh, Chaucer's Tales, kind of like tell a bunch of stories and draw it all together kind of movie. I really, I really enjoy that. Like uh, yeah. when they finally make Hyperion, the Dan Simmons novel, it'll it'll be like that, you know, kind of. <laughs> I'm, I'm excited. I've been waiting for that movie forever. But um, I, I thought that was really original or not. It was retro original, whatever. But I, I enjoyed the storytelling aspect of it. Um. Yeah. Uh, well, and the reason why, part of one of the reasons why it was so high on my list and what I think it didn't work for other people quite as much as it did for me. Well, first of all, like, look, there's some kind of real world stuff in the sense that it was the, the like the only movie I saw in the theater over the summer. <laughs> so right. like, I admit there was a degree that I like kind of was like really enjoyed the experience like one of the reasons why i don't see a lot of movies in the theater right now is geographically there's no theaters near me and it's a pain right. in the butt for a non-driver to get to the movie theater and james cameron just recently talked about this in an interview where he was like it's not so much the communal experience of going to the theater that he thinks is the thing it's the deal you make with yourself that i'm gonna go to a movie and for me, the deal that I make with myself that I go to a movie is I have to get on two, like a bus and a trolley and yeah. it's, it's a, it's a pain in the butt. It's not easy for me. And so one of the reasons, and I love movies in the theater, but I just didn't, I just don't see a ton of them partially because uh, it's such a pain in the butt. So I, I admit that part of my experience was that I hadn't seen a movie in the theater in a long time and I really enjoyed seeing this. And That's a totally legitimate reason to like something. I like that. And I also really just loved Idris Elba in this. And I'm a huge fan of Luther, right? Yeah. And um, so so Idris Elba, it, it, uh, sorry, my wife's making me laugh because she's playing with the dog. Um, and, uh, but Idris Elba, go, you know, I think of him as Luther and seeing him as this 
Jin. Yeah. Like, and just like some of the dialogue and just some of the weird, the, the fact that they made the weird dialogue work, I just was very transported by the movie. And for that reason, um, I think that's why I was high on my list is because I felt really transported by the movie in a way that only the top movies on my list did for me all year. So this and my top four are all movies that I felt very transported by only one of which I saw at home. Um, And so it's very hard to transport me into a movie (laughs) when, when you're watching at home and you can pause it and take bathroom breaks and like get up and, get a Waterloo or whatever. Uh, right. <laughs> giving away my drink of choice. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so my number three, 3,000 Years Longing. Anything else you want to say on 3,000 Years Longing? Because no, I, I, just, I, I think, you know, I, I wonder what people will think of it if they go back and watch it on streaming or whatever. Like, hopefully they enjoy it. Okay. And your number three, because my number three is one that you've already listed. Uh well so my number three was everything ever all at once my okay two, so that's my number oh wait that's your number three that was my number three yeah that's my number three so we have two wait, we just how are we off on this count We're, did I have too many movies let me count my movies one two three no I've got to, I don't know where we messed up we'll have to go back and watch the tape but uh yeah so your three is everything 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 everywhere all at once, once. yeah that's my number three. All right, let's talk. My number four is yeah. Is oh wait, what was your four? Is three thousand years longing. Oh okay, all right. So uh, my number three, everything, everywhere, all at once, and yours. Um, Yeah. uh, Do you want to go first? I mean, honestly, I don't even know what to say about this movie. Like, it's got elements of a lot of different things. Parts of it are just insane, Um, but it was just really good and. I feel like you just have to see it. I don't know how else to say it. You know, in in a year where the multiverse was, was everything, this was a very good multiverse movie. Yeah. um, Look, I was, I saw this one in the theater. I was engineered to like this movie. Um, I think, um, I can't say his full name. Key, the uh, the short round coming back was one of the greatest moments of cinema this year. Um, I think he should be, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but uh, for part of this, but I thought he was incredible in this movie. Michelle Yeoh was incredible in this movie. Um, Michelle Yeoh, I've always loved Michelle Yeoh. I've always thought she was amazing. She's in Crushing Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which I think is one of the greatest movies ever made um ever 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 i think she's in um one of my favorite movies the heroic trio which is one of the most underrated Mm -hmm. superhero movies ever so i you know i'm michelle yo i you know and she's on star trek she's awesome and she just abs her jamie lee curtis and key like all three of them are incredible in this movie and when you think about what it would take to make this movie they shot it all out of order they we're all over the place. You're doing all kinds of multiverse things. So like everything that they had, that the two directors, the Daniel brothers, or or things that the Daniels that they go by, like that they had to do to keep this together. The only problem I had with this movie, and the only reason why it's not number one, uh, probably is because it overstayed its welcome by about 15 minutes. Agreed. (laughs) And everybody knows it because there was a bit, because that movie is so overwhelming and, you know, and some of the best moments of the movie come down to like, you know, Michelle Yeoh, like you're getting fat and all that stuff, which I didn't understand is uh, like the telling the truth is something that Asian immigrant mothers are apparently are really known for. <laughs> right. I think and, Americans are known for not doing saying things directly well, i don't know i guess work, but I, yeah i don't know i'm just i'm just telling you what the yeah. directors were i'm saying. married for spoiler alert or whatever i'm married to a german so you know we get yeah. we get the direct everything so <laughs> well and um yeah so there, there were so many emotional moments there were hilarious moments great action just it it and it was a great theatrical experience that communal experience of everybody laughing and getting, and just like 
you know, things with like the hot dog fingers when there's like people <laughs> like WTFing in other parts of the yeah. theater out loud and all those things. It made, it was, and here's the great thing. It's an independent movie that was made for relatively low budget. That was a smash success in the COVID era where, you know, even before Top Gun Maverick, the word of mouth, it was entirely word of mouth. It was, had very little marketing and that is really cool. They didn't start marketing it until the word of mouth had already gotten it. Yeah. You know, I was amazed when I went to see it opening weekend in San Diego. Now it had been out in LA and New York for a little while, but I didn't expect there to be a packed house. Like when I saw it. So um, yeah. Uh, great movie. Yeah. Excellent. Incredible. So uh, Issa, you're number two. So I'm going to, I'm just, I have to lay a couple things down first. <laughs> okay. My number two movie is going to, I'm worried it's going to make you mad because you'll know what my number one is when I tell you what my number two is. I want to, I want to, can we yeah. take a quick break? Not a break break, but, uh, but I want to go back and talk about one other movie first. Sure. Not on the list. Uh, Don't worry, darling. Um, which, yeah which was on my it's on my mind the movies the first half was great but it didn't really work out um i just want to mention how good florence Pugh was and how much i enjoyed the yeah, setup for that movie yeah, yeah. but the, and and then this is a total spoiler but i don't think that matters but this movie skip ahead had the minutes. weirdest yeah skip ahead if you don't want to be spoiled on it. i'm saying people oh, yeah, yeah, skip exactly. ahead skip ahead if you don't want to yeah. Yes, yes, I'm not not me. I'll talk really. Uh, so here's the spoiler part. But this movie has a setup. It has it's a type of movie, right? And it's supposed to have a setup and then like a middle part and then a, a climax. Instead, they made the setup like pretty much the whole movie. Then the climax was just really fast and really silly. M my comparison would be if you were watching The Matrix. Uh, in the Matrix, you get Neo's life before he knows what's going on. Then he finds out what's going on, and then a bunch of important stuff happens, and then the movie ends. Uh, this would be like if Neo had found out that he was living in the Matrix on like in like the last ten minutes of the movie. Like it was just right. the pacing made no sense. Great performances, just that that part made no sense whatsoever. So I just wanted to get that in because I felt like that was I've really been wanting to make that Matrix comparison for people. So you know, right. <laughs> Yeah, it was like, I, it was like two uh, hours of you know, just going. Well, I enjoyed that, that movie. Well, wait, that I enjoyed that as a, I enjoyed that flawed movie. But, yeah, I enjoyed it too. Yeah. Okay, and, so and back back to. It's just interesting too because of all the drama that was behind the scenes in that movie. Oh yeah, totally. Like, totally. You can't. But so my yeah. my my number two movie on of the year, and I'm I'm a little nervous to say it because I feel like you're not going to agree was Maverick. <laughs> Top Gun Maverick was my number two movie of the year. I loved this movie. Now, I saw it in the theater five times. <laughs> okay. Now, to be fair, it was spread out over many months because that thing was in the theater for a really long time and then it came back or whatever. But, um, you know, also I feel like I should mention that I have like that subscription pass with AMC. So it's not like I paid for it five times or whatever. Right. But yeah. um, man, it was a good movie. I, it had everything I'd want in a Top Gun sequel for, uh, for nostalgia. And it also just stood on its own really well. The story was told really well and tight and it's got a lot of action and you can definitely watch it over and over and cheer in the theater, despite the fact that you're just, you know, it's a little too pro-American and what and all the criticisms that I'm sure can be that are super nice. It was very, very enjoyable. Okay, so my feelings on Top Gun Maverick, which I only saw at home. So keep in mind, I know the movie was designed to be a theatrical experience. Yes. Um, and I I just couldn't bring myself to go with everything that it takes for me to go to, to a movie. I watched it at home when I was sick, which is part of it. Um okay. And I was very sick and I, for whatever reason, it felt like a Hot Shots movie to me when I watched it. And partially, <laughs> I think it felt like a Hot Shots movie because I think, you know, I, I sat and I watched it on a laptop 
while I was sick. And you're oh, supposed come to come on. You're supposed <laughs> to watch this movie in the theater. And I know I didn't yeah. get the I did did not get the experience I was supposed to. Yeah. That being said, the world of Top Gun doesn't have to have logic, but the the, the lack of logic in this world was so hilarious to me. I did not see that as a negative. I saw that okay. as a hilarious positive because the rules of which the universe that Top Gun takes place in is hilariously ridiculous. Oh. And the fact that the country doesn't even get named that they're attacking, that, <laughs> totally. they, that they, you know, um, you know, just the rules in the universe. Don't think too hard. Don't ask too many questions. Think, no, you them. can't. And 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 um, I, I'm not anti Tom Cruise. I actually like Tom Cruise as a movie star, um, and I think he's psychotic and crazy for doing the stunts <laughs> that he does. And I know that they said that they had that he blew takes where he was supposed to be looking scared flying the plane because his smile was so big because he was just loving life, <laughs> like risking life and limb. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not anti Top Gun Maverick, but. Uh, and maybe it has to do with the experience that I had. I was never a Top Gun fan, so oh, that, that's that. See, you could just I could have just sat in the theater and had the theme song played to me a few times over and in, in a loop, and I'd be like, "This is amazing," you know. Like it, yeah. It, it but let's not uh, let's not undercut. It had a nice growth story for the character. The the uh, the stuff about Goose was really touching. You know, it really uh, it was it was not a, a Val, Val Kilmer scene was great. <laughs> Yeah. Kilmer was great. It it definitely was a surprisingly multi-dimensional movie, I, I will say. I mean, it obviously at the end of the day, it's a freaking top gun movie, but it was uh it was definitely a popcorn movie. It was a lot of fun. And you know, like I said, I saw it five times in the theater. There was not another movie that I I don't think you there go was to the bathroom when they started playing the song at the piano because, like, I would have gone to the bathroom because that that's no, I thought that was great. I love oh. that. I, I was like wiping tears from my eyes, not really, but almost. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's the only movie that I saw more than once in the theater this year. I'm, I, I feel like there must have been a Doctor Strange. Um, aside from Doctor Strange, it's the only movie that I saw multiple times in the theater this year, and usually I, I see stuff a couple times if I like it. So yeah um so yes yeah, you have that, the AMC pass. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly it's amazing <laughs> um well we might have the same number one i'm not sure um, we have to have the same number one we have There's to, no have, way the we number, the same we have, to. Yeah, yeah it looks like it so my number two is alex garland's men um the i didn't see that i meant to see it and i didn't get around to seeing it um alex garland's men um is like i'm a huge alex garland fan first off like he's never made anything i haven't liked um including his novels like the beach and that he did before um and and i include dread which he ghost directed part of and definitely wrote the script for um which was super underrated um but i'm a huge alex garland fan his his tv series he did last year devs was incredible um and um i like that he does weird esoteric stuff men is definitely not a movie for everyone but uh it's a horror movie that and the the performance by one of the actors in it and i won't spoil why but is there's one actor who does some really heavy lifting in that movie um and uh, it's a really great performance. It is one of the weirdest movies I've ever seen. If you try to sit there and explain it and try to know what's going on, like a lot of Alex Scarlet movies, you're not going to get it right away. Um, that's fine. Um, but it's a, it's a great movie that kind of makes a message about gaslighting and mansplaining. And uh, it's a whole horror movie based on those kinds of things. And, uh, it's super, super good. So Men is my number two movie. Cool. And I'm guessing we have the same number one. We, we do. <laughs> Mr. James Cameron has done it again. Yes. So our number one, much to the chagrin of many of the people that are listening who may tune out <laughs> now, is definitely Avatar The Way of Water. Um, and so we had the same one 
three and seven. So seven, yeah. Okay. Yeah, not too shabby. Uh yeah, Avatar the Way of Water. Um, and listen, I have advocated for this movie so much to the point that people have accused me of being on James Cameron's payroll, which I wish <laughs> I was. Um yeah, I know me too. Seriously, how do you get on his payroll? I would yeah, like to be there. Like I'm working on it. Um <laughs> Yeah, uh, I just genuinely, you know, I liked the first Avatar. Um, I didn't totally love it, um, but I loved The Way of Water. I think it's significantly better than the first one um, for many reasons, which we will get to. Um, I'm going to try. I don't think you can spoil this movie, even if you know some things. Um, some people like might want to tune out because of this conversation because a for two reasons one there's going to be gushing over avatar which people seem it seems to be really cool to hate on avatar oh, um which we will not especially be especially if you haven't seen it especially if you haven't seen it and think you can talk all about it um one and two um we're we are going to spoil things so if you do you know i don't don't think we can talk about it without it but before we get to spoilers in the non-spoiler way, my opinion on Avatar Way of Water is that it fixes, I think James Cameron was listening to some of the things that people complained about. Um, I think some of the complaints about the first Avatar are wildly misguided. Um, but because I think people just like have an itch in their craw and they want to go after the top grossing movie of all time, which is weird because... Yeah. You know, it shouldn't be well. I guess it, it it's like the thing of like I gotta hate on Metallica because they're so popular, or I gotta hate on the sure. Beatles because I'm right. too cool to like the Beatles. And I, I think, think Turnstile would be Turnstile would be a good example. is a good example. Yeah, um, and 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 so there there is that. But for me, I think he's he fixed a lot of the story problems. It's clear that he got really good writers to work with him in his writer's room. They're clearly thinking out. If you if you're a writer and you're paying attention, you can see the seeds he's planting for for three, four and five. And they're you can tell that they're thinking of the overarching story and there are certain ways where they're paying off things that happened in the first movie that were confusing that I wasn't sure what what he was doing in the first movie. But there's a lot of authorial direction to what he's doing in this one. And my God, it looks even better. If you thought the first avatar looked incredible and some people they are like, it's a cartoon. Well, no, <laughs> it looks. Well, you know incredible. what? One thing about the visuals, the jungle scenes in the second movie actually did not look as good as the jungle scenes in the first movie. And I, I just saw the first movie when they re-released it right before the new one came out. So I've seen them both very recently. Yeah, There was a weird, like, high frame rate issue in the new one that made some of the creatures in the jungle look a little unrealistic. Like, I, I don't mean unrealistic, like, you know, they had too many wings or whatever. I just mean, like the foreground and the background didn't quite match perfectly in a, in a very, in a, it brought me out of the view kind of way, purely from like a technical, um, you know, whatever it might also, whatever. Well, but, an avatar uh, the, depends the on one, how you saw it projected too, because that does make a difference. Cause yeah, I will definitely that, try every other version. <laughs> I will yeah. go back and see, I saw the IMAX 3d version. I will try all the other versions for sure. <laughs> um, but I mean, I'm excited, but, uh, the uh so but the underwater scenes looked incredible like the everything after the jungle was just the best thing i've ever seen like it was it was absolutely amazing and i should add that the original avatar seeing it re-released it's still the best looking movie i've ever seen uh you know whatever 12 years later however many years it was later how many years was it it was a lot of years 13 13 years later it's still nothing else came close in that 13 years like it's that's kind of crazy in itself yeah. And look, everyone can give shit to Big Jim. And, uh, you know, I, you know, look, he went vegan in the time since Avatar and he's real passionate about it. So like, you know, um, but the thing about it is, is nobody is ever going to make a movie that looks 
like this. No one's going to have the attention to detail, the, you know, whatever. And the man made, and just like I said, with George Miller got a ticket for life for me for making Fury Road. James Cameron got a ticket for life for me for the experience I had watching Aliens in the theater when I was in sixth grade. And he will always yeah, have Terminator it. Aliens. I mean, I'm, I'm, I will buy a ticket. I even, I love Titanic. Titanic's a great movie. I don't, you know, whatever. It's not my style of movie, but I loved it. Guy knows how to make a movie. Um, the Abyss. Yeah. I mean, just take your pick. I liked all of it. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I, he knows how to make some, a movie. Some better than others, but like, you know, great yeah. director. Yeah. And um, he's pushing the envelope and he's, and if people, the thing about it is, is, you know, one of the criticisms that I saw that really cracked me up was I, I was arguing with this. There's this guy who's a blogger who's like a, a millennial who's into retro sci fi. And, mm-hmm. and, and he blogs about being a millennial reading 40s and 50s sci fi, right? And uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And, um, and I saw that he said, well, Avatar isn't doing anything that science fiction novels weren't doing in the 60s. And my response was, yeah, but it's the first time ever that a movie (laughs) was able to capture that on film and make it look real. And people are so freaking spoiled that you get a science fiction film that that doesn't cheat in any way and tries to give you everything as real as you can make it and make it look beautiful and like even if there was deficiencies in the story which i don't think that there are that's amazing I didn't, I didn't think that. yeah the only thing that was the like i'll ignore all criticisms of the first movie i feel like most of them are completely unfounded and misunderstandings of the movie like the comparisons with dances with wolves or whatever those are just you didn't understand avatar for the most part yeah um, but unobtainium was a little silly <laughs> well was- right and in this movie i thought edie falco was 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 a bad casting and i thought um like her character didn't bring anything to the movie and so there's little things like you know but all the good outweighs you know and look what are the and when i you know look i understand like the the i'm bothered by the white savior aspect to it that's the one criticism where i kind of get it but i also think it's a it's a I haven't really paid attention to the movie because Jake Sully does not save the day in the original avatar. Right. Um, the white savior isn't going to save the day. It's Iwa. It, it is nature itself um, being awoken by grace connecting to it. So it's more yeah. though. It's more that, but at the same time, it's it and it's setting up and what they're setting up for the future movies. It's so clear is that through Sigourney Weaver's character, who is who is now the avatar of the story. She's the avatar. Yeah. She's the avatar not of a human. She's the avatar of Iwa. And she's going to be the chosen one who, who communes with nature and fights back and saves the day. Not the, the white human character. Yeah, no, so, for sure. I think if you think about the the story and what's happening sigourney weaver is the more important character in the first movie um than than jake who's like the foot soldier or whatever you know what i mean like i think that's gonna become more clear as we go yeah and then this movie is more about the family and 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 those things and it and the people who and look um the people who say like it's not developed it's funny i saw a chart where somebody like charted all the different arcs of the characters from the first movie together Uh to show when people are like the characters are wooden and thin and then they made this chart that showed like all the different ways that each character had an arc Mm -hmm. every character in avatar the way of water has an arc down to the whale has an arc totally that was incredible and the best arc of the movie right and like arguably the relationship between Lo- Loak, i think that's the kid's name and the whale is one of the most emotional best parts of the movie and like um the you know the scene where he sits on the whale's fin and first tries to talk to him and he's like i see you and like all that oh my god great mm-hmm. 
Yeah. He's so good. And I'm not just saying this to, to make Dano laugh, you know, because it's, it's a whale, but now Avatar is another franchise that's going to have the one with the whales. Yeah. Um, although they might have whales again. So it'll be, it won't narrow it down if they, if we see the whales again, you know, if we so. see the whale and the whale is the hero of, of yeah, the totally. story more, more than Jake. You know, so again, get rid of your white savior. And I'm, I'm, I need to see it again. I've only seen it the one time, but I'm almost positive that the the whaler, the bad guys, the whaler uh, ships, said cetacean ops on them. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Like I'm almost positive I saw that it said like you know like like something some abbreviation or something like set ops or something like that. It should have been so different, but I think it was a Star Trek joke. I'm pretty sure. So. That that would be great, yeah, and um, yeah, and the movie just um, like a- every character from all the different, you know, reef people, like all those different, like even like the sons, the kids of the of the of Cliff Curtis and um, Kate Winslet's characters, like they all had arcs, you know, the 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 reef leaders, they had arcs, like like it was all thought out it was so well done and i never got bored in in the three hours like i was completely transported and just like completely in it and you know and it's it's funny as somebody who knows so much about movies like i didn't watch any of the behind the scenes stuff ahead of time because i was afraid of being spoiled but as i'm sitting there watching that i was just like how the hell did they do this like totally there are never when i watch movies do i think how the hell did they do this and except for when i'm watching avatar and when i was watching avatar the way of water i was sitting there thinking how the hell did they do this i have no no clue oh my god this is amazing Um, i mean you know what they spent 13 years doing right like that was not uh, like you could have made you can't just make that movie in like a year you know (laughs) like that movie is is epic in in ways that like one of the most this is going to sound really silly but one of the most amazing things about it is that it doesn't they somehow make it look like they just pulled it off easily you know what i mean like it's like the the amount of effort that went into that movie is just off the charts like it's it's crazy like and not just the not just the special effects but like like all the thinking of of just the the complex characters there's a lot of complex characters and you know you're you've got a lot more of that to come you know and like it's just yeah. it's just incredible that it's all fitting together so well and and can be a 3 hour movie that doesn't even feel long at all you know yeah for it, non- it is a theatrical action. it is a theatrical experience yeah. i i'm sure watching it at home won't 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 be as powerful but yeah i'm sure just like the first one i'm sure it won't be yeah um but you know there are some movies that can be you know, like if you're watching, you know, a Star Wars movie that's two and a half hours or uh, the sub, well, the original, <laughs> some, I shouldn't just say any Star Wars movie, but some Star yeah. Wars movies, you don't feel like they're too long. You you know, you could watch it again right away. Uh, Avatar seemed very similar. Like it was not, it definitely never felt too long. Um, it could have been longer. I would have been fine with that, but it was, it was a good length. I, I need to really see it again to judge that a little better, but uh, it really pay, it was paced very very well all right so um i um i think we're i mean is there anything else you want to say about avatar like i i i, I, mean, I, I feel like we did it I, I i think there's nothing else to say just go see it if you haven't seen it and if you hate it maybe i don't know what to tell you if you like movies if you like going to movies you should like this movie yeah and and um i know it's really cool to dunk on on avatar and um I, I think the reason I'm so passionate about defending it is because um well not just because I like it but just because I you know and it's not like James Cameron needs me to 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 back him up yeah. but um but I think I just think it's I, like 9 times out of 10 it just seems like the people are they're not they're not even thinking about the movie for real like they they, they don't they yeah. don't even know what they're talking about it's just like like they haven't even you know or they'll just say stuff that's just like no like that didn't happen in the movie you want to complain about unobtaining uh, unobtainium yeah. or whatever which i think they did a better job this movie of having yeah. a, a reason with the you know for magic every, world juice yeah yeah and uh, um which 
reminded me of shark fin soup as a kind of a yeah kind of kind of an totally. issue and then a little um, heavy-handed but it's a heavy hand that i really enjoyed so you know yeah exactly yeah no it's it should be heavy-handed but look it, i saw it i saw it opening day i saw like a afternoon showing like the first show the theater was packed people were cheering you know that's all yeah. that's all you need. i hadn't seen a movie where people were cheering for a very long time except for maverick yeah and and um there's that and look look listen if, if the message is heavy-handed it's like cool like and one of the other things too that people got to remember is james cameron isn't making movies for just you and me and just the people that fit this demographic and that demographic he he has to make these movies to appeal to the most human beings on the planet possible yeah And, and that's why sometimes i don't like some of the exposition in it but like for to work for little kids and for people who are not as educated and not as good and don't go to as many movies or internationally, you know, who are not English speakers, whatever. It's it's just, you've got to get those four quadrants of everybody. It's, it's very hard thing to do. And most of these people who are complaining about it don't have the first clue about what it means to try and make something that appeals to the entire planet. And right. if he's making a movie that appeals to the entire planet and it has a message of environmentalism and indigenous rights. Yeah. Great. Right. Go for it. All right. So really quickly, we'll go through this last part. Um, at the end here, let's give our awards for the year. <laughs> um so uh supporting actor actress um best actor best actress best screenplay best director so let's start with best supporting actor do you have uh off the top of your head i know that's kind of a hard thing yeah i am completely i did not realize there'd be so much homework on this podcast so uh i'm gonna have to just make some stuff up here but uh uh that's that's to tell you who my supporting actor would be okay go for it um uh uh key um he kwan from uh everything everywhere all at once um that was a re- that's a really good choice his the be you know when you don't really know what's happening yet and he sort of switches uh personalities or whatever you want to call it like that was really well done that was uh, and he had to do kung fu fighting and he had yeah. to juggle like different timelines characters yeah. from different oh. universes he had to do a lot and yeah, no, that was that was an excellent performance. And it was the first time he acted in two decades. Best supporting actor, right there. Yeah, I'm, okay, I'm I'm right there with you. <laughs> um, and uh, supporting actress. This this one's a little harder for me. Um, and as far as like a, an an obvious one, but maybe, hmm. I don't know. It's hard for me not to just do all the actors and everything everywhere all at once, but <laughs> totally. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say, because I think, um, well, she's probably the lead. And I was going to say Tilda Swinton and 3000 years of longing, but um, yeah, I'm not so sure on supporting actress. I, I don't have like a real obvious one right off, off the bat, but I, I would um, go with, uh, it wasn't on the list because I left Marvel movies off, but Black Panther, uh, Angela Bassett, I felt her performance was amazing in that. I, I mean, honestly, you could, all the characters had great performances in that movie. That was a, that was a very powerful, uh, very sad movie, <laughs> you know, like, um, you know, obviously with the circumstances around Chadwick Boseman, it was not going to be like a fun popcorn movie you know that would have been really strange if it was um but yeah that was a re- that was a really powerful performance okay and um i'm going to agree with my wife that the idea of actor and actress is kind of outdated and they're all actors but <laughs> these are the categories that exist in the awards whether yeah. we like it or not um so for let's um, be the change that we want to see in the world yeah <laughs> uh in that regard um uh best actor i gotta eh, i gotta think on that one um you don't want to just give it to tom cruise for maverick no i definitely don't want to give it to tom cruise for maverick 
um it's weird because well i'd give it to daniel radcliffe for weird um, yeah that was that was quite good maybe oh, or the the guy from men um <laughs> uh for obvious reasons yeah i don't know if i have one for that for 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 um actress the best the two best actors uh, the, in anything this year were Kate Blanchett and Tar and um and Michelle Yeoh and everything everywhere all at once. Yeah. I think Kate Blanchett's probably going to win the Oscar, but man, I would love for it to be Michelle Yeoh. Uh, that would be great. Yeah. And I and, and look, they interviewed each other for the actors on actors thing and it was fun watching them gush over each other, but um uh, I, I think her performance was the best acting performance by any one all year in any movie. So it was really good. Yeah. Um, so for best screenplay, um, you know, it's funny because I don't think it would ever happen this way, but um, I actually think uh, um, Avatar I'd give it to the Avatar crew because they wrote the best movie of the year. But I, I can't. I, I would say let's do it. Let's pick another one just because that's that's too easy, you know. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I would say they did have thirteen years of rewrites, right? So, um, um. Well, you know, here's the other thing too. Like, probably one of the best examples of screenwriting over the year was not on my top list, and that's Glass Onion. I just thought, yeah as a work of screenwriting and everything that he had to yeah. juggle, I thought it was a really, it, would it was, have been, it was really excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I think it's the best movie. I'm just saying best screenplay, which yeah. is totally different because yeah. the final movie is going to be something. So yeah, in that regard, I would say maybe that's that. And then, um, you know, and then, um, but I mean, best director, come on, you got to get yeah. it. To big yeah. James. It's got to be James Cameron there. Yeah. Yeah. It's gotta be James Cameron. All right. Um, I think that's it, Isa. Um, I um we've we've gone pretty long here. Uh <laughs> but that's, that's <laughs> a lot of good movie. movies, like surprisingly good movies this year. Like it it definitely um when I first started, I was like, Oh man, this was the pandemic. There haven't really been that many movies. And then I when I started making my list, I was like, you know, I'd be really hard pressed to find 10 more movies that I really liked. But um, you know, so it was a very light year for movies. But I'm excited to get back to normal movies, hopefully soon next year, maybe. <laughs> right. Um, they need to make they need to get Star Wars back in, in theaters. But uh, for one sure. thing is uh, something that's going on. And. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. I'm sorry. We have to wait two more years for the next Avatar. Like, yeah, it would be nice if we got one of those a year. But I know that they're not that easy <laughs> to make. Um, oh, it's funny that the post production alone is uh, is two years on yeah, those. I mean, it's not surprising, even with the technology they built to make it. You know, it's still yeah. yeah. Well, it's all filmed. They just have to do yeah. the post production, and then um, four, four, and five are all designed. They designed all five. They did yeah. yeah. And uh, according to Guillermo del Toro, the um, uh, movie four is the one that he thinks is going to blow everyone's mind because you know he's best friends with cameron and he's seen everything okay. nice. yeah he he let slip that four is the one that he most wants to see so Thank something you. about four yeah as guillermo's attention um but uh all right so uh i um easy we're gonna be on zoom a lot over the next <laughs> all right <laughs> next I'm ready. while so we'll see you again <laughs> next for um episode 100 which um we're keeping secret so okay. i will then, say i'm excited i won't say why yeah um and then um i don't we'll probably do prodigy we're I, and again i apologize we're going to do prodigy late but um it's not out of disrespect it's just out of my schedule and i gotta i bet yeah. a lot of people have busy uh you know end of years anyway so everyone will understand yeah so on that note um if anyone is that much of a nerd movie nerd and listen this far um <laughs> good on you uh and we hope we paid it worth it and gave you uh something fun to think about for the movies and maybe found some movies you want to watch um and you can always let us know in the comments if uh we steered you towards a great movie we'd love to know
So um, Issa doesn't like to be found on social media. So um, <laughs> there's that. And uh, of course, uh, everybody knows where to find me. So we'll see you next time.